Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to Fairport Christian Fellowship. I, normally, I would uh, have the opening verses up on the wall for you to read, but I'm going to do something a little bit different today. I am going to read from the Bible. You should say amen to that. Amen. <laughs> amen. Uh, psalm 103, There's it, it's a great psalm. I can't read the whole thing, but I picked out certain verses. And what I really wanted, uh, instead of putting it on the wall for you to read today, I want you to actually think about what I'm saying. I know that you probably do that anyhow, but uh, just don't be self-conscious or anything right now. Forget about everybody else. You know, if you have to uh, just close your eyes and listen, because this is about your soul. David writes this psalm, and it's, uh, he, he starts out talking about his soul, and our soul, that's the real you, okay? It, you look in the mirror, and you think uh, what you see is you. Well, that's only part of you. The real part of you is your soul. And David would say in another place, my soul is thirsty. And to quench the thirst in your soul, it has to be a spiritual thing. It, it can't be done by anything else in this world. You can't quench your soul that way. It can only be quenched by God himself. And so that's what David writes here. Let me read it and read it slowly. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from destruction? Hallelujah. Who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies your mouth with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is merciful and gracious. Slow to anger. Abounding in mercy. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Bless the Lord. O oh, my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh, my soul. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today that we can come into this place and we can be mindful of you. We can forget about everything else, Lord. And we can just come before our God and worship you from our soul, O Lord, with all that is within us. Because you are merciful and kind, you forgive us. Lord, you redeem our life from destruction. Uh, Lord, we can be on a path, and much of the world is on a wide path to destruction, but you are able to redeem us from that path. How I thank you for that today. And my soul blesses you. And we come into your house today with that first in our, our minds and our hearts that we want to bless your holy name. We want to worship you, Lord, from the heart because you are worthy. Be with us today. Make your word alive to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're able to stand with me and worship, why don't you do so?
mercies are new. Every day, Lord, we're trusting in you. Every day, Lord, your mercies are new. Every day, Lord, we're trusting in you. Every day, Lord, your mercies are new. Every day, Lord, we're trusting in you. Thankful God, you stay the same. You will not change. Your promise is true. Thankful God, we lift up one more.
reveal your heart to me. Let me stay and rest in your holiness, Word of God's Spirit. 
merciful to us, Lord. And Father, I do pray, Lord, that uh, we would bow our hearts now and that we would come and hear what you have uh, ordained for us to hear, Lord God, and what you have for us, Lord God, because you love us. I pray for the pastor, Lord, Pastor Dan, that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit right now, Lord God, and that he would present your word just as you have given it to him. Give it to us, Lord, that we would become more like you, Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, you can greet one another. <laughs> I know that we've come through a, a, a couple years of pandemic. Okay, that's enough of that. It's good to be able to do that, you know. When you, when they told us we can't do that anymore, you know, we got to be, you know, social distancing. That's and and I'm okay with that. If you're not comfortable with greeting one another, that you don't have to. But it feels good to be able to do that again. It's part of what church is all about being able to greet one another and fellowship. You know, we're a family. You know that, don't you? Albeit a dysfunctional family, yes. <laughs> Maybe your family is dysfunctional. Well, my family is. Uh, but this family, the family of God, you know, you all have a seat at the table, at the big table. You know, it was, it's great. I, I was also thinking during worship, because we also worship in giving. We don't take an offering here. We have a box back there. And, you know, during that pandemic, it threatened us, especially at the beginning. You can't meet together. Well, what 
What does that mean? People don't give. No, you guys were great, faithful. And we're still here. And let me just remind you, without your faithfulness, we won't be here. <laughs> and, but I'm thankful for you guys and, and your goodness and that you're obedient to that. And you offer to the Lord from your heart, and he takes care of your needs, doesn't he? Also, what I was thinking of during the worship, we sang a song, Word of God Speak, which is great. And that's what I pray for. That, that the words to that song, that as we get into the word of God today, it would speak. Can the word of God speak? Yes, it can. It does. It will. It will speak to you as individuals. It will speak to us corporately. Let us have our hearts softened towards his word today. Let's listen for his voice. And when I prepare the message, I'm always looking and asking the Lord, please, what is it that you have for your people? What is it that you, you want to say to your people? You can prepare messages from, from chapters in the Bible, and they can become very mechanical. I want the Word of God to speak to your hearts, and that you leave this place today encouraged and built up. The other thing that we sang about was mercy. <laughs> merciful. Oh, what a merciful God. And that's what our opening verses were all about, his mercy. So many people are going through life thinking about the wrath of God. And that's a real thing. And I won't hide that from you. But for now, we're in the age of grace and his mercy. And his mercy is new every day. You should be saying amen to that. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's just pray. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for your word. And I do pray it's the Holy Spirit that brings the word of God to life. And so I do pray that you would do that today, Holy Spirit, that you're in this place. And that you're softening our hearts that we may receive what you have for us today. Words that will build and encourage and strengthen us as your family today. So let that happen today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. First book of the Bible. And we're going to continue on in Chapter 8, you might remember that uh, uh, Noah, he built an ark under the instruction, from the instruction of God himself. Because the world had gotten to a place where it was filled with violence and man's thoughts were only evil continuously. And God said, I'm not going to strive with man. And, and he's going to have to destroy that. So he, he saw Noah, and Noah was, he found favor in the eyes of God. And God told him, I want you to build an ark, and he gave him instructions. And we did that a, a few weeks ago, uh, and, and the rain started to come down, and the judgment of the world came. And then we'll pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 8, but I got to ask you, you know, I asked the Lord, what can we glean from this chapter? What can we as your family, your children, your people in 2022 glean from Genesis chapter 8? What, what is it going to matter for us? It says in verse 1, then God remembered Noah and every living thing. Well, where were all the living things? In the ark or under the water. But there's nothing else. Every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. You see, he God remembered Noah. Noah remember him that he is called by Peter a preacher of righteousness. 
and he began to preach as he was building that boat for how long did it take him? A hundred years? So people were saying, you're crazy. We're crazy too. Yes, that's it. He is our ark. Jesus is our ark. But he was a preacher of righteousness, and now he's in that ark. And God remembers the preacher of righteousness. I just want you to, I, I don't want to forget this. By, by the end of the chapter, or maybe next week's chapter, he's going to live for another 350 years. He's still a preacher of righteousness. Before the flood and after the flood. He is a preacher of righteousness. But was anybody listening? Doesn't seem so, does it? Well, how can I relate that to our world? Is anybody listening? If more people were listening, all these chairs would be filled. I would be putting up more chairs. Travis asked me, how come the church is different? I said, I, uh, you know, I'm going to squeeze them all together. I'm not going to spread them out and squeeze them together, okay? But I pray that there's a day where I have to put out all those chairs and that there's so many children here that they have to sit on the floor and they're standing room only because people are listening to the Word of God, not to me, but to the Word of God. That's what I look forward to. But I wonder how, how discouraging that might have been for Noah. That every day he was preaching righteousness, building an ark, and nobody was listening. And I see that today in our world, that there's not a lot of people listening to the Word of God. They're listening to everything else. But you're here today, listening. God remembered Noah, and it says God made a wind to pass over the earth. I, I kind of highlight that because, you know, before, as we saw the creation and we believed that there was a water canopy over the earth, protecting man from the harmful rays of the sun, and the whole earth was a, a tropical, the whole earth, north, north and south pole, everything was tropical in weather. Now, the weather patterns have changed. That water canopy came down in the flood and caught, was a cause for the flood. And now we have wind, probably for the first time. God caused a wind to pass over the earth. It's kind of funny because, you know, usually the month of April around here is kind of windy. You know, he's drying things up. Hallelujah. I love May, don't you? May gets warmer. We're looking forward. We're not very far away. What else happens in May? Flowers, trees, allergies, <laughs> pollen. I can almost see the pollen flying through the air. But we do love the spring. It's new life. That's really what this message is about today. That's why I've called this a new beginning. A new beginning. And, and Jesus would say it. Behold. I make all things new. And so Noah is going to, and his family are going to see the world new, brand new, cleansed, washed. And I want you to understand that for your life too. Isn't it great that God can make all things new? He can take your life, which was on a path of destruction, and redeem it, as we read in Psalm 103, and make all things new. So if you forget everything else in this message, remember this, he makes all things new. It's a new creation, a new beginning. It was also suggested to me that I might recall this message, I think it's a good title, A, a Family on Lockdown. They really are a family on lockdown, aren't they? Well, God made a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained and the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased 
Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. Let's just stop right there. The, the Bible tells us, God wrote this down, that the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. Is that where it is today? You know, I don't want to. I don't want to get too crazy into this, but you know, it's very provocative. Uh, that yes, they do have scientific means to discover the ark. If you want to go to YouTube or Google and Google the Ararat anomaly, okay, the Ararat anomaly, you will find all kinds of things about what they believe is Noah's Ark, okay? They have scientific means these days, and you can watch these videos, and they'll show you all the scientific means that they have, that they can, they have found this anomaly. It looks like a ship on the side of a mountain in, in Turkey. That's the, where the mountains of Ararat. Are. You can watch that video. They have the scientific means to show a, fa a framework of the boat, of the ark, that is the same dimensions. It's there, you know? What does that mean for you? God tells the truth. Yes, yes, yes. Where's the ark today? Well, the Bible says it's on Mount Ararat. Okay, that's where it is. I thought it was in Kentucky. <laughs> I took my grandchildren there a few years ago. I told you that so that they could see. You know, they go to a Christian school. They're taught by their, their, their parents and their teachers about Noah's Ark. Is it true? Is it true or is it just a story? Is it just a fable? You know, did it really happen? Well, you can dive into all the scientific things. The Institute of Creation Research does a wonderful job of telling you all the scientific things that they found, you know, fossils of fish on the side of a mountain. How did they get there? <laughs> well, you know, so it's good that that's there because there are skeptics in this world. and. They see the scientific evidence of it there, and that helps them to become believers. Okay? So there are, is that. There is that. Then there's just unbelievers who just say, no way. And they scoff at it. I'm going to tell you today that I don't need to see the scientific evidence that Noah's Ark is there. I don't need to. It does not affect my faith whatsoever it doesn't strengthen my faith that the word of god is true i already know that the word of god is true and what he says here i just believe it i know it's true again we go to genesis chapter one in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth if you believe that trust in that and know that Everything else is easy. Can he put an ark on a mountain? Can he bring judgment on the world? He can do anything. Okay? Anything. And so it does not affect. But I do recognize that there are people that maybe need to see that, those documentaries about Noah's ark being on Mount Ararat. And there is, there are people who have seen it, scientists who were skeptics, that after they saw it, they believed. So thank God. There is that group. It reminds me of someone else. You got it. You know your Bible. Doubting Thomas, we called him, and we're familiar with him. He has a, a bad name. Because Jesus came to his disciples after he was uh, resurrected, and he met with them in a room, and there was a, a, Thomas wasn't there. And then they told Thomas, oh, we have seen the Lord. 
We have seen the Lord. What did Thomas say? Uh, I'm not, I won't believe it until I can put my finger in the holes in his hands or in the hole in his side. So what did Jesus do? He showed up. Thomas. Thomas, go ahead. And what did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. And this is the verse that I want you to see that's going to be on the wall. John 20, verse 29, Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I'm in that group. Probably you're in that group. Do you need to see Noah's Ark to strengthen your faith? No. You have already believed in Jesus Christ. You have already believed the Word of God, where where it says, and it says in the Word of God, that the Ark is on Mount Ararat. It does very little for my faith to understand that there's people that have found it. And you can see, they in Turkey, they have, you know, of course, it's become somewhat of a, a tourist attraction. And so they build a building nearby that they, you know, you can come to that building and see all kinds of things. And, and you know, so you, you can do that. Uh, let me just remind you, this Verse will not be on the wall. It's in Mark 16. He appeared to the 11. This is again after he's resurrected. And he rebuked them for their unbelief and their hardness of heart. Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Okay, so that's what we're always in, in danger of. Having a hard heart and having unbelief. We, we need to trust the Word of God, and we need to have faith in God's Word, what He says is true. And if He says that this is true, how many of the other things that He says in His words are true? Yeah, everything. And so when it says that He is filled with, He is, he is rich in mercy, what does that mean? He's rich in mercy every single day. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. So we'll move on here. Verse 5. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So the ark is rested. Uh, They're probably going, oh, man, thank God. Thank you, Lord. Remember that. The God's in the ark with them. He rides through the storm with you. He's always with you in your storm. But it rested, and that must have felt good. It was kind of wavy. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. Wow, fresh air. Fresh air. Think about it. Then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out for himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand, took her, and drew her into the ark himself, to himself. You know, the raven, they they are what? uh, Carrying, that means they are meat eaters. Um, He didn't return... You know, he could probably find a body to float on. But doves won't do that. So the dove returned to Noah he, because it didn't find a place to rest. He's going to land on a tree, right? And he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And Noah knew, Noah knew, Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. Okay, so the, the dove returns with an olive leaf. Note that it's, notice that it's an olive leaf. It's not an olive branch. You know, that's the, 
symbol for peace, right? Uh, an olive branch in the mouth of a, a dove, but it's actually an olive tree. Okay, he might have had a tough time with a a branch. He might have had a tough time with a leaf. But God, you know, speaks to the olive, hey, take that leaf back to Noah so he can know. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked. And indeed, the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Okay, then it says, Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives, with you. I, notice, you know, it gives us some time periods there, you know. There's, there's more than a month between where he removed the covering of the ark, saw that things were drying up. Did he go out? He waited for God to tell him to go out. That is something for us to remember, okay? It may seem that we should just go, just go. Hey, looks like ground's dried we can go now let's go now no no wait for the lord to tell you the next step god knows but i see the that obedience in noah and i'm sure he was in a hurry to get out of there you know you think you've had cabin fever over this past winter imagine being in an ark for a whole year He's got cabin fever. I think I would be tempted to see, oh, the ground's dry. I'm out of here. But he waited. And sometimes we need to wait to hear the instructions from God when it's time to go out of the ark. He says, you and your wife, your sons and your sons' wives with you. Just, just think about that for a second. In the next few chapters, we are going to see, and I don't know, maybe you want to read ahead so that I don't have to read all those names to you. The genealogy, the, the, the families that come from the ark. That's what we are. We all come from Noah. We all descend from Noah. We have, we're descendants. We're family. I just say that because the family is under attack. A strong nation is made strong by strong families. Now, I know for some of you here today, you might be saying to yourself, oh, whoa, man, that's not a very encouraging word. My family is, is broken up. No, if you're part of this family, you're part of a strong family, okay? And he is able to restore and rebuild and do anything. He can do that. Noah waited until God said go. In verse 17, bring out with you every living thing of all the flesh that is with you, birds and cattle, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. Multiply, I love that. You know, my wife and I, when we were married, we started to have kids. We had three, so we were more like adding. But what happens after the addition? My kids begin to multiply. That's, that's how it happens. It goes on and it multiplies. And that's, I love God because he likes to multiply. That's the kind of math that he's into, multiply. So Noah went out <clears throat> and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird and whatever creeps on the earth according to their families, went out of the ark. Noah went, Noah went out into a new world. Imagine that. What he was used to for all those years was violence, right? That's how God described 
things before the flood. The earth was filled with violence. And let me remind you what Jesus said it's going to be like on the days that he returns. It's going to be like the days of Noah. When the earth is filled with violence. All kinds of violence. Wars, yes. Violence in our cities, yes. It's filled with violence. Why? Because the heart of man is only evil continuously. But he gives us a new heart. And he finds people like Noah. He finds people like you. He gives us a new heart. Noah goes out into a, a new world, and this world is cleansed from all of its filth. All of the violence is gone. It is now brand new. What can we glean from this message today? God makes all things new. He washes away all of the filth, all of the junk. Revelation 21.5 says, and you can read all of Revelation 21, it says he creates a new heaven and a new earth because the old earth and the old heavens have passed away. But he makes a new heaven and a new earth where there is no curse. But verse 5 says, Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. (laughs) Just like he did with Noah. And what he does with your life. He redeems us from a path of destruction. We're easily going and walking down that path. And it's a wide path, Jesus says, that leads to what? Destruction. And the path that leads to life is narrow. And few are those who find it, but you have found it, haven't you? And those who have found it have new. He makes all things new. He makes all things new. He makes the earth new, the heavens new. He makes a new you. Maybe I should have called it that. A new you. The end of the verse says, And he said to me, John's taking this from Jesus, and he's saying, Right, for these words are what? True and faithful. Didn't we start with that song today? Faithful God. Can you believe everybody? How many people can you believe? Can you believe me? I hope you believe me because I'm trying to tell you the truth. God is true. He is faithful. He does not lie. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Numbers 23, 19. He's not a liar, and he's saying to John here, my words are faithful and true. That means I will make all things new. It feels good to be clean, doesn't it? That's what Noah's going out into. He's stepping out with his family into a new world, and it is absolutely clean. All the violence has been washed away. I didn't have this one on the wall. Psalm 51, 2 says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Further on in verse 7, Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. It feels good to be clean, doesn't it? I mean, I enjoy a hot shower. I, was, I got in the shower this morning. It was warm. I said, you know, Lord, thank you. There's a lot of people in this world who don't have hot water. We don't even think about it. It's just there. It's just there. But there are so many people in this world that don't have that. We are blessed. 
But we're not even talking about getting cleansed with water. We're, getting, we're talking about being cleansed of sin. That is what destroys us. And how do you get cleansed from sin? The blood of Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's by his blood. Just remember that. And when you are cleansed by the blood of Jesus from your past, yesterday's sins, 10 years ago sins, 20 years ago, when you're cleansed, wow, it feels good. He makes all things new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 on the wall says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's not talking about Noah and the ark. It's talking about you and me. A new creation. A new person. That's the way he looks at us. When we cry out to him and ask for forgiveness, he cleanses us and he Right away, we're in his family, right away. You don't have to, okay, now I have to clean up this and clean up that and clean up this. No, he does that by his blood. Oh, yeah, he's going to do a work in you, and you will change over the years. I have definitely changed over the past 40 years. You can ask my wife. She'll tell you what kind of a person I was before we married. In the first 10 years we were married. You can ask her. You might think, well, Pastor, you're so cool. You're so good. You're, you are just, you're so holy. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. But I am forgiven. His mercies are new every day. Just remember that. I want to, I want to, this isn't going to be on the wall, I don't think. I'm going to read to you something talking about this. kind of Because I, I look for things in the Gospels that will bring out something. You know, and I kind of think that this instance that I'm going to read to you, I'm not going to touch on everything. It's a sermon in itself. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50 says, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. Jesus ate with sinners, and he ate with with Pharisees too. He didn't care where the food was. He just went there. What happens? Behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. We don't know her name, but we know all about her. A woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil (coughs) and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head, and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. So this woman who is a sinner, we don't know her name, she came in and started to do these things. She must have heard Jesus speak before. And he spoke not as a Pharisee would speak, not as a religious priest or anything would speak. He spoke because he brought forth truth, but he brought it forth with grace. He was full of truth, and grace, gracious words he had. When people hear the gracious words and they need their hearts, are so, their hearts are softened because they've been on a path of destruction. And that's what this woman was doing. She was a sinner and she was on a path of destruction. Yet she heard the words of Jesus and she was touched by them. And she responded to them. These are things that she does that are fruits of repentance. John the Baptist would say, bring forth fruits of repentance. This is the kind of repentance we're talking about. 
you know, she was touched in her heart and she began to weep. And she began to wash his feet with her tears. And it wiped them with the hair of her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. She was bringing forth fruits of repentance. After hearing Jesus' merciful words. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. He said to himself, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. That's what we do. They're a sinner. I need to stay away from them. And better than them. That's what this Pharisee. God hates that. But even in this, he didn't rebuke Simon the Pharisee in so many words, but he did point out something. As he goes on, Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. That's a debt you can't repay. Too much. And the other 50. And when they had nothing to which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many. Jesus knew her sins, didn't he? Not just her recent ones, but all of them. Because he makes the comment, her sins, which are many are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And this is really the part I want you to see. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine? This woman was weighed down, obviously, wasn't she? She was weeping. And crying. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. It's good to be clean. It's good to be washed. Noah's stepping out into a brand new world. It's been washed. But so is this woman. So is this woman. It's a brand new day for her. Brand new day. Washed. Forgiven. Those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, he's still talking to the woman, never mind those guys, your faith has saved you. Go in Peace. That's what comes. You're forgiven. Peace. Peace in your soul. Peace that the world cannot give to you. Peace that nothing in this world can give to you. There is nothing here, nothing you can order on Amazon or go to Wegmans and buy off the shelf that will give you peace. There's only one thing. That's to have your sins forgiven by God himself. You have to believe that he he went to the cross for your sins. That he paid the price for all of your sins. But man, when she reaches that point, man, it's a new day for her. Absolutely new day. It's a new start. Forget about what's behind And reach forward to what's ahead. Forget about yesterday. Forget about last week. Forget about your failures. 
reach forward to what's ahead and press on. Press on. You know, it's good to be clean. And he said, go in peace. Oh, man, that's what it says. I think it's in Romans 5, the first couple verses. You have now peace with God. Not just the peace of God, but you are at peace with God. Before that time, you're at enmity with Him. You're struggling against Him. Now, because your sins are forgiven, you've had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have peace with God. Peace with God. It means you can be confident that when you stand before him, he's at peace with you and you're at peace with him. It's good to be clean. It's good to be have new things, right? Noah is stepping out into a brand new, washed clean world to begin a new beginning. A very new beginning. And this woman is starting out the same way. It's a new beginning beginning for her life. But let's finish the chapter, verses 20 and 21 and 22 of Genesis 8. It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. I guess some things never change. Nor will I again destroy everything, every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat. I can really relate to that these days. Cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. And that's the way it's been. Now it shows us again here it's a new weather system, isn't it? They didn't have this weather system before the flood. Now they have a new weather system. Wind has come in. But now he says seed time and harvest. Hmm. Springtime and fall. Right? Cold and heat. We're coming into the season of heat, right? Warmer weather. Well, what about the people down in the southern hemisphere? It's getting cold. <laughs> Winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. But I, I need to make sure that I get this in here. Noah built an altar to the Lord. That's the first thing he did. What does the altar represent? It represents, well, he sacrificed there. That's why he brought an odd number of the clean animals so that he could sacrifice. You remember that he's a preacher of righteousness. And a preacher of righteousness knows that it's substitutionary sacrifice. Blood must be spilt for the redemption of sin. And God showed this in the Old Testament through lambs and things like that. But do we do that anymore? No. Why? It's been done. Once and for all. Jesus, once and for all, it says. First Peter 3.18 For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. It's been done once and for all. Uh, Noah built an altar, and that speaks of, and I want to encourage you with this today, an altar. Noah had an altar, a place where he went <coughs> to meet with God. <coughs> now, God lives in us through his spirit, and he goes with us everywhere, but it's good to have an altar. Do you have an altar to, to God somewhere? You know, Moses, he went to the tent of meeting to meet with God, and the glory of God came down, spoke with him, spoke with him face to face as a friend speaks to a friend. Daniel prayed three times a day. He had an altar, right? David inquired of the Lord, it says, many times. Jesus himself withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. 
Abram, we're going to read about in Genesis 12. It's going to cover a good portion of Genesis. What is he known for? Building an altar. He lived in a tent in the land which God gave him, and the tent represented his relationship to this world. It's temporary. Temporary. But he built altars everywhere he went, and, and that described his relationship to God Almighty. You know? And we, are, we, sh- we should take this. Like I said, we need to glean from this chapter the things that we need to glean for us here in 2022. Build an altar. It speaks of a relationship. Having a relationship with the Lord. Not just on Sundays. Not just on YouTube. But every single day, an altar. You know, it's in Genesis 17. God meets with Abraham, and he said, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. I will make a covenant with you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. In verse 3 of that chapter, I love it. The, then Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him. I emphasize that, with him. God wants to talk with you. He doesn't want to talk at you. He doesn't want to beat you over the head with his word. He wants to talk with you. And the way that you talk with him is to have an altar. Noah is an example here. He builds an altar. Let's start this out right. Let's start our new life out right with an altar, building our relationship with God Almighty, with Jesus Christ, his Son, and the Holy Spirit. It goes with us everywhere we go. Stand with me, and we'll finish in prayer. <clears throat> oh, Lord God, thank you for your word today. Oh, man, Lord, it is so good to be clean. It is so good to be forgiven. It, it is so good to start a new day and a new life where everything is made new and there's such a hope of restoration and revival in our soul in our lives in our families too we are so thankful for that today we're so thankful to you lord god that you gave us your son that he might bring us back to you. That's really what it was for. Man's sin separates us from God, but Jesus paid for our sin and brought us near to you, Lord, and we can have a relationship with you, and we can build an altar, and we can walk with you every single day, Lord, and we can talk with you, and you will talk with us. For we are your sons and your daughters, your family. We thank you for all these great things today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today. Have a wonderful day.